So a pastor was working in his office one afternoon when his assistant came in, uh, kind of big-eyed, to tell him that the police were there to see him. Now, that can always be a little concerning, but the police were not there to arrest him. Rather, they were there to ask for his help. In fact, the police stated that the neighborhood around their church was one of the very worst in the city, and they couldn't arrest their way out of the problem, and so they asked the church to help. That church, in fact, did engage. Uh, They went out, they started mentoring young men, uh, they began providing Christmas trees at Christmas, turkeys at Thanksgiving, uh, doing Bible clubs in various areas, helping with some of the physical look of, of the neighborhood as well. And after just 18 months of that church engaging that neighborhood, the police, not the report, the, the church, but the police reported that a violent crime was down by 75%, and that calls the police were down by 27%. They had literally transformed the neighborhood. Not to forget the spiritual aspect of what had occurred. Uh, the church had done Bible clubs and had seen over 100 kids come to Christ, as well as many people come from the community to that particular church. Uh, that pastor's name is Matt Tice, and he is from Las Vegas, Nevada, of all places. And since that time, I had an opportunity to check back in with him recently. Uh, the, the city of Las Vegas actually declared him to be the citizen of the month. Here's a picture of him with his family. Now, I told Matt, like, don't get a big head. Like, when you have actually arrived, I will be flying into Vegas, and I will see your face on the sphere, all right? That's when you will know that you have arrived. Uh, But no, so just an incredible impact in the city, and also he's now impacting state government as well. So I bring that up not to say that this church in Las Vegas has everything figured out. There are many great churches around the country doing great things. There are great ways to get engaged here at Cornerstone. I bring it up because of where it occurred in Sin City, in Las Vegas. And in Acts chapter number 18, Paul's going to minister in a city with a lot of similarities to Las Vegas, a place called Corinth. In fact, in the ancient world, to say that someone was a Corinthian or to Corinthianize something was to say it was a person that was given to luxury, partying, and debauchery. All right, so you can see kind of the connection. Well, if you're joining us for the first time in this series, we've been going through the book of Acts. And the big idea for the study is the early church carried the gospel through its known world in about 30 years, transformed an empire in about 300. So now the church, at times, we seem intimidated a bit, uncertain amid swift cultural changes. So what did the early Christians, commanded by Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, what did they do that perhaps we're not doing? Here are their acts, and may they inspire our own. Just a a real brief review. Uh, Remember Acts is Luke part two. We start with the ascension of Jesus. He tells the disciples, hey, I've told you what you need to know. Now get out there and take the gospel to the world. He ascends and we see this transition book and we see how the early church faced internal division, persecution, corruption, and, and impact from all sorts of different parts of society and yet it thrives. In Acts chapter number 15, as the gospel has kind of gone out of Jerusalem to uh, the apostle Paul comes to Christ and he's gone on his his first missionary journey. In Acts 15, we see that the church answers finally this question of whether the gospel is going to be a splinter off of Judaism or if it's good news for all people, for the Gentiles. And we talked about how, what an incredible, incredible good news that is for us. In Acts 16, Paul's there in Philippi. He sees Lydia come to faith. He sees the Philippian jailer come to Christ. And then last time we saw how Paul went to Athens, the very center of, of philosophy and the ancient world. And Paul proves that we, as we've seen that the gospel was better than just the temple. It was better than the pagan Greek gods. And last time we saw how God or Jesus is greater than even philosophy. And that brings us to Acts chapter number 18 as Paul moves from Athens down to Corinth. First thing I'll say is, well, what happens in Corinth? All right, you know the phrase, what happens in Vegas supposedly stays in Vegas. All right, that's terrible advice, by the way. All right, uh, but kind of like, what happens in Corinth kind of stays in Corinth. So what, what is this city, and what, why did Paul go there? We pick it up in verse 1. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when, Paul, and when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit. And he testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. 
And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. That must have been a fun sermon to listen to. And he departed thence, and he entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. All right, so we've been looking at Paul's second missionary journey, how he came up. And remember, he, he was there kind of in this area trying to figure out where the Holy Spirit was going to send him. He gets the Macedonian call. He goes down to Athens, and then he comes down to Corinth. Corinth was one of the largest cities in the ancient Roman Empire. Some believe maybe um, larger than Athens, certainly larger than Athens, maybe a population of up to 200,000. It was the capital of Achaia, which would have been kind of two provinces in Greek proper as we would understand it. It was known for creating bronze. If you remember the gate beautiful back towards the beginning of Acts where the lame man was healed, and I showed you a kind of a rendering of what that might have looked like, it was 75 feet of bronze. That was Corinthian bronze. And so it was known for its bronze works and thus was pretty wealthy. Um, there in Corinth, and you're going to see this if you read 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians um, you, you see this in Paul's writing. One of the things that Corinth was known for was a temple to Aphrodite. And I'm trying to be delicate here, but there were a thousand prophetesses or priestesses that were essentially temple prostitutes that would come down every evening uh, to, to commit immorality in the name of their religion. And so as this was a crossroads, people would come to the city. Now, one of the interesting things just about the kind of geography of this place is you can see there's just a little spit of land in between Athens and Corinth. And Julius Caesar thought it would be a good idea, and then other Roman emperors thought it would be a good idea to build a canal through that what's called an isthmus. And it was started in 67 AD. Now, I just mentioned this. Um, if there are any guys out there that have like a honeydew list, and you know, it's been a couple years uh, that some of that stuff's been on there. This made me feel a little better. This project started in 67 AD. It was not finished until 1893 when they invented dynamite. All right, so I'm just feeling a little better about my to-do list at this point. Uh, the reason why it took so long, and here's a picture of one of the temples to Apollo. It's just a beautiful setting um, there in ancient Corinth. Um, you can see this little isthmus, and there actually is a canal through there. And the reason why it was so hard to build is, well, it's solid rock. All right, but now you can actually sail uh, through that, you'll see pictures of, of boats kind of being pulled through there. And so Corinth is, is this place, and it's known for its sexual debauchery and through its, for its luxury. And this is why in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, Paul says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, I mean, these are a lot of upstanding folks, okay, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And this is such a beautiful verse. And such were some of you, you know, may know the rest of it, but you are washed and you are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And so Paul brings the gospel to this very forsaken place, like the Las Vegas of Greek. Here comes Paul with the gospel and it's transforming lives. Now, Paul comes to, to Corinth, and it's clear from kind of the narrative and what Jesus, Jesus is about to appear to Paul kind of for the second time. Uh, we, he's had other visions, but Jesus is going to come to him again, that it really seems that Paul is, is down. He's depressed. Now, why in the world? Like, everywhere he's gone, he's been thrown in jail. He's been beaten. Right? He's gotten kicked out of the city. He's, and so we just think, oh, he, he has this battery and there's nothing affects him. No, he's human too. And it seems like he's, he's discouraged. And so he comes to this place and he meets this, this couple that's going to be in a lot of his missionary letters moving forward. And it's Priscilla and Aquila. Now it says that they were born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius, who's the Roman emperor, kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Now... I find this fascinating because when we look at the Old Testament, we think Paul, 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 Paul. But actually, the church in Rome had already started. Why? Because at Pentecost, there were believers from all over the place. And so why did the Roman emperor kick the Jews out of Rome? Well, here's, listen to this, and, and you think, why did, why did the Christians get kicked out? Here's the, 
inscription from Suetonius. It says, Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S, he expelled them from Rome. So why did the Jews get expelled from Rome? Because of Crestus, Latin for probably not, it's not too hard to tell. This was Christ. And essentially what was going on is that the Jews, as we've seen throughout the Acts narrative, when they began to tell them, hey, the, the temple is, is no longer necessary. Circumcision is no longer necessary for salvation. What normally followed was a riot. And because the Romans, they, they can't figure all this out. They're just like, you guys, get out of here. They just kick them all out. All right. And so Jesus is already causing disturbances right there at the Roman. It's turning, Jesus is turning the world upside down right there in Rome. And that brings Aquila and Priscilla. Now, a lot of times you will see Priscilla first and then Aquila. And so the question is, well, why is that? Because maybe one of them had, was Roman or one of them was Jewish. Uh, perhaps because Priscilla was more mature in the faith. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But you also see, you often see Priscilla first and then Aquila. Now, this is fascinating because you get a little glimpse into the life of Paul. Like, isn't he this, you know, he's this, this apostle and maybe angels bring food down to him. Like, how, how does all this work? I don't know. But it's clear from this passage that Paul was a tent maker. And the, the word is actually leather worker. But because they had Isthmian games, like Olympic games, that rivaled what happened at Athens, they would have a lot of tents. So it says that Paul reasoned with them in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Well, why did he do that? Because he was working Monday through Friday. Let, let that just sink in for a second. Because sometimes we look at work, you know, as we are followers of Jesus, we look at going to a job, which is just, oh, I got to go do the same thing in a factory 800 times, or I got to go deal with these kids, or I have to go to work for a large corporation, or for me, I have to go to court, those sorts of things. And, and it can seem like it's less than ministry. But Paul didn't see it that way. Now, he's, there's going to be a gift given, and he's going to get back to kind of preaching full time. But you don't see in this passage that that Paul said, you know, work is beneath me, or it's disconnected from the gospel, and it's not something I should be doing. You know, so here's the Apostle Paul. He just reasoned with the most intelligent folks in the ancient Mediterranean world, and a year, like a week later, he's sowing tents, all right? He, he's not pretentious. He's, he's doing what's necessary to survive. And so when you get up Tuesday morning, Thank God for Labor Day, all right? all right? So when you get up Tuesday morning and you head back to that job and you just, oh, why do I have to do this? I'd rather be... That is a part of the Christian life. And even Paul himself was a tent maker. Now, it says that he reasoned with them in the, in the synagogues. And remember, this is Paul's modus operandi. He goes first to the synagogue, speaks to the Jews, and then he goes to the Gentiles. And so this was not him just showing up and just preaching without there being some conversation. This is a dialogue. He's reasoning with them from the scriptures. Hey, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Messiah. As we've seen some of these great passages, uh, as we've seen the, Paul preach, there's recorded sermons of his. He's bringing that to bear in Corinth. Now, he, he has this moment in, in Corinth where he just is done. Now, it's, it's clear from, uh, from what happens. You, you see that Silas and Timothy come. Many scholars believe they brought a gift. So then he says he's pressed in his spirit. He's like, I've, I've got to do something. I've got to go preach the gospel. And he reasons with these folks, but they contradict themselves. This is an interesting phrase. They opposed themselves. Have you ever met somebody that literally is opposing themselves? Like, please don't do that anymore. That is going to harm you. And they do it again. All right. And so maybe this is Paul being a little bit in the flesh. I told you, it, it seems like from the passage that he's tired and, and he's depressed and he's, he's upset. And so... He, he goes up there, like you imagine, at the front of the synagogue, and they're opposing themselves. And what does he say? He says, your blood be upon your own heads. All right? And he like shakes his apron, and he shakes his clothes out. Like, that had to be a fun Sunday morning. <laughs> like, I'm going to the Gentiles. And then it's like kind of like crickets, everybody's stunned. Right? And you can tell, like, Paul is just, he's done. Like, I'm, I'm done trying to teach the gospel to you, and you keep refusing it. And so he goes, and he shakes it off. Now, Shaking out a garment or shaking the dust off of your feet, this is, this is a really pointed statement. Because Jews, when they left Gentile territory, 
They would literally shake the dust off of their feet, lest they taint Jewish land with dust that had, I don't know, like their version of Gentile germs. All right, we talked about how they would keep their robes close so they wouldn't touch a Gentile or they would be unclean. And so he's, he's, this is a covenant-breaking aspect. Like, I am shaking it off. You shake off the dust of the Gentiles while I am shaking the dust off of my garments and I'm going to those that will actually listen to the gospel. This is an extremely strong statement. And then look at this, this beautiful thought here in verse 8. It says, Crispus. And who's Crispus? He's the chief of the synagogue. This is the main rule. This is an individual that would have been vested in saying that the temple is enough. The law is enough. That Jesus isn't the Messiah. And yet it is Crispus, the, the head of the synagogue, that comes to believe. And it says, with all his house. All right, so there's a trend in Acts where you see, first of all, Cornelius and his house, Lydia and her house, the Philippian jailer and his house, and now Crispus and his house all come to faith. And I, I find this so encouraging that the gospel is meant to transform families. And this is the, the initial little building block of the church, the family. And so when we gather here on Sunday, it is a celebration of this other God-ordained institution, the family, that you're doing family devotions with your family. You're praying. You're pouring into your kids and into if your husband into your wife, wife into your husband, as you follow Jesus together. And so this, this is a body of believers, and, and sometimes that doesn't work out. Sometimes folks do not have that in their lives. Um, but the, there's often in the book of Acts this thing of the household, the whole house comes to faith in Christ. And so that's what happens in Corinth. Number two, I, I found this passage just so encouraging, so profound. All right, so a spiritual antidepressant or God's antidepressant. We, we said that Paul is in this state. He's kind of in a, a funk. He's, he's just down. He's discouraged. And why not? I mean, like, I mean he, he's been thrown in jail. He's been beaten. He's been whipped. He goes to Athens. He shares the gospel and only a few folks come to Christ. There's no apostle to the Athenian church because of that or epistle to the Athenian church. And so he's just, he's tired. I'm sure he's discouraged. You know, I'd really like not to be beaten again. That would be nice. And it says, the Lord comes to Paul in a vision by night. And here's what he says. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Hold not your peace. Well, for Jesus to say to Paul, don't be afraid, what does that mean? Paul was afraid. And again, we look at the Apostle Paul like this guy had no fears. He's courageous. He's just telling people, he's like shaking his, you know, his apron off and I'm going to the Gentiles. And he, he stares down the Athenian high council. He stares down leaders all across the, the Roman world. And yet he was also afraid. I don't know about you, but that encourages me. I think we all deal with fear, with anxiety, with the difficulties of life, with telling a family member about Jesus, what if they reject me? With telling, inviting someone to church, what if they reject me? And so Jesus is so kind, he's so compassionate, he's so loving, isn't he? Because he could have come in here like, Paul, get up and get going. I told you to go to the Gentiles, and I told you it wasn't going to be easy, so what do you expect? And he just says, Paul, you're my child. Don't be afraid. And then he gives him what I consider kind of a threefold, three pieces of God's antidepressant. Now, I recognize that there is a clinical depression, that the brain is an organ, and that there can be a clinical need for things. But what I'm talking about here is the, the aspect of our lives where we wrestle with just being down, with being, in a sense, we call it depression. We, we don't want to get up and keep don't doing it anymore. Like, why does this matter? I don't want to be yelled at anymore. I don't want to have people coming against me anymore. Why can I just shut the windows, chain the door, and just cut out the world and just go move on from what God's called me to do? Because this is hard. So there's the three ingredients. I just thought it was beautiful. I am with you. That's number one. And no man shall set on you to hurt you, or set on thee to hurt thee. That's the second ingredient. For I have much people in this city. That's the third ingredient. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. I wanted to dig into this a little bit more. So Jesus comes to him, and the first thing that he says, be encouraged. Why? Because I am with you. And isn't that enough? Wouldn't that be enough? I am with you. 
And you say, well, it wouldn't it be nice if Jesus showed up in a vision and told me that? Like, that would be a lot of help. Thank you. <laughs> but you know what? He did. In Matthew 28, 16 through 20, in the Great Commission, Go therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, what? I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Isaiah 41, 10 Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help you. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And so God's antidepressant, in a sense, throughout Scripture has always been the first thing is I am with you. And sometimes I forget that because we, we are social people, right? And we, we do want people to encourage us and we don't want to be criticized. But you know what is a mark of the believer? The entire world can be against you, but if God is not just for you, but he is with you, that's enough. And so have you taken a moment to maybe sit outside, read your Bible, and just sense the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life? He's there. Maybe you've got too much noise, and you haven't felt it lately. And so when Jesus comes to encourage Paul, what does he say? I'm with you. God is Emmanuel, God with us. And so he cares for us and he says, hey, I'm with you. One other, Joshua 1, 9, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So do you see this like throughout scripture, the, the first ingredient of God's encouragement and God's antidepressant is God's presence. Next, no man will hurt you. Paul, no one's going to hurt you this time. And I think of Romans 8, 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. That's pretty much anything, okay? <laughs> it's the point of the verse. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I've shared before one of my favorite quotes. that We are immortal until God's work, our work on earth is done. George Whitfield said that. And so no man will hurt you. He says, look... They, even if you are killed, you're going to be with me. No one can hurt you. And then the last one, I, I find this beautiful. He says, I have much people in this city. Now, was there a big church in Corinth? No, not at this time. But what is Jesus saying? I know that there's a church in Corinth, and they're going to come to Christ. I have much people in this city. And you're not alone. Now, you're not alone because I'm with you, but there are also fellow believers, and you're going to see them come to faith as you minister there for a year and a half. And as I was just meditating on this week, uh, what the Holy Spirit brought to mind is, what did, the, what did God do? How did he encourage Elijah in the wilderness? Do you remember this? And this, this is just one of these connections where all the scriptures inspired. You begin to see some of these threads come together. Elijah, what is he? He's depressed because he doesn't want to face Jezebel. All right? who, who wants to face the evil queen Jezebel? All right? And they have him, and they're going to kill me. And what does he do? God takes him into the wilderness, and he takes him up into a mountain. And remember, God wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. But what was he in? The still, small voice. God's presence. You aren't going to be hurt. And then what does he say? I have 7,000 left in Israel. So you see, like this is God's antidepressant. This is the... This is the ingredients. And so how can you kind of take that into your own heart and into your own life this week? I'll talk a little bit more about that as we conclude in a few minutes. So we see Jesus himself. And again, I, I find this so encouraging because the Apostle Paul is always like, he seems like he's out of reach. Like he wrote most of the New Testament. How in the world can I be spiritual like, like Paul? But we find that Paul's afraid. He's depressed. And perhaps he, he kind of lashed out at a few folks. <laughs> Maybe the whole like shaking the dust off of your clothes was a little much uh, for the folks in Corinth. I'm not sure, but it does seem like he's just down. Number three, a mysterious uh, mistrial. And so here, you know, Paul has come down from Athens into to Corinth. He's a part of the, the province of Achaia. And what we believe from history, there's actually an inscription that, that proves this probably AD 51, AD 52. There's a new proconsul or no, a new Roman official that comes to Corinth. And Paul's been there for a year and a half. The Jews uh, don't like it. The Jews that don't believe in the gospel don't like it. And so they go to Gallio, is this guy's name. And verse number 11 is where we, we pick it up. 
And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Roman province, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look you to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes. This is, this is like, oh, okay, if you get denied justice, what do you do? Well, you go beat somebody, all right? Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of these things. And Paul, after this, tarried there a good, yet a good while. And then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered in the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. So this year and a half is the longest period of time where Paul's going to stay in a place other than in Ephesus. And so he spends a lot of time there, pouring into the church, building the church. And so then there's a proconsul that comes. And it seems like the Jews figured that, hey, here's a new opportunity. There's a, a new sheriff in town, if you will. And so we're going to go to him, and we're going to accuse Paul of violating the law. Now, previously, there have been successful attempts to, to basically say, hey, he's not following, he's, he's not obeying Caesar. He's saying that Caesar isn't Lord we see that in, in Philippi. Here it's just, hey, there's a, he's, he's teaching things against the law. And it seems like, like in that indictment or in that complaint to Gallio that it was actually ambiguous. Was well, it Jewish law? Is it Roman law? And, and Gallio, we understand uh, from some historical sources that he was a bright, responsible, and, and an expert in legal matters. And so he's probably coming into uh, this area, trying to figure out what in the world's going on. The Jews bring this case to him, and he says, you know what, get this out of here. Like, I, I don't have time for this. But if you look in the verse, it says that the Jews accuse him. And so Paul's like, all right, yeah, this is pretty common. You guys think this is novel? I, this is, uh, this is, it's been a year and a half since I've been in a trial, so maybe, you know, I'm getting a little rusty here. But he begins to open his mouth to speak, and Gallio basically dismisses the case. And he has the soldiers, like, run everybody out. What is this? This is the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy. Paul, no one here is going to hurt you. I'm going to give you a time of respite in this city. And so Gallio runs them out. Now, where that occurred would have been in the judgment seat in Corinth. And so if you can see this picture, um, this is, there would have been large pillars. You can see a few of the broken pieces there. But we, biblical scholars believe that this is the judgment seat or the bema seat that Paul often talks about in, Cor uh, in Corinthians, in First and Second Corinthians. Why would he use that? Well, they would have known of this judgment seat. And so kind of picturing Jesus or God on a judgment seat, it would have been very easy for them to picture that. They would have walked past it. And so there's this mysterious mistrial. Like every other time Paul's been brought in front of the magistrates, they just get beaten or are thrown in jail. But this time, Gallio sees through the ruse and says, nope, you guys get out of here. And so the Jews, they're mad um, the Jews, the Greeks that aren't following the gospel, they get mad, so they take Sosthenes, who's the new head of the synagogue, because Crispus, the former head, is now a follower of Jesus, and they beat him. Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 1. I'll give everybody a, sec a second to, to get there. 1 Corinthians 1, 1. And so we've seen this other follower, uh, this other leader of the synagogue come to Jesus, and then here's Sosthenes, He's the head of the synagogue. He's beaten. And when Paul opens the epistle to the Corinthians, what does he say? Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. The old, the old line, if you can't beat them, join them. Maybe if you get beat with them, maybe that's why you join them. I don't know. But I think maybe Sosthenes saw through, oh, like here I am just trying to teach you know, basic biblical principles and the law, and I'm trying to lead this synagogue, and I get beaten for it. Maybe Paul and the Christians have something right here, because I haven't done anything wrong. I'm innocent, yet I have been beaten. And so that's two for two synagogue leaders coming to faith through Paul's ministry in Corinth. 
Now, the scripture says that Paul, he, he shaved his head in Centria because he had a vow. Now, Paul has, has been at the forefront saying the Gentiles can come to Christ, and you don't have to follow the old ceremonial law, but it is clear that, that Paul is still a, a very devout Jew. And so we think this would have been part of keeping a Nazarite vow, and he's going up to a, a, a particular celebration in Jerusalem. He's, he feels like the Spirit's pulling him there. And so he actually takes time to shave his head to fulfill his Nazarite vow. And so Paul says, I'm going to become all things to all men. To the Greek, I'll, I'll be a Greek. To the Jews, I'll be a Jew. And so he's doing that as he heads back. And we've talked a few times through the series about how the early church did this incredible job of, on one hand, fo staying focused on the gospel, but while also understanding tradition and trying to lead people towards faith. And so Paul's doing that. So it says that Paul stopped briefly in Jerusalem, and then he heads back to Antioch. And so Paul is not some renegade preacher. He is rested. He, he's focused in a body of believers. So he goes to the leaders in Jerusalem. And then he, it seems that he prefers Antioch. Because I imagine every time he's back in Jerusalem, I mean, there have been some years that have passed. But if he killed family members of the people in the church in Jerusalem, that could still be a little cool. <laughs> you know, a little reception might be a little cool. I mean, if you're in Jerusalem, and then he heads back into Antioch. Now, it does say that when, when Paul came uh, from Corinth over into Ephesus, he brought Priscilla and Aquila. And so Priscilla and Aquila are just an incredible couple. They begin to minister there in Ephesus. Paul goes uh, to this particular synagogue. They want him to stay. And this is interesting because everywhere else, Paul's been kicked out. But here they want him to stay. And he says, I, I would love to, but I have to go and I will return if God wills which is exactly what James tells us to say if we don't know about the future. So this concludes the second missionary journey. And we're about to see the launch of the third. And so we see Paul, he's, he's gone through a time of discouragement. God led him and encouraged him through it. He has now gone back to Ephesus, and then he has checked back in with the church leadership in both Jerusalem and Antioch. And, and just to emphasize that here, I... I've mentioned this a few times, that as John Stone Street says, the church is God's plan A. There is no plan B. That there, if you're going to be a New Testament follower of Jesus, you must be planted in a local body of believers. And sometimes we, we kind of forget that. We just go on, well, I can just be uh, my own Christian. I can just you know, worship with God in the woods. But that is not the model that we see in the book of Acts. Even Paul himself needed the encouragement, needed the accountability of a local body of believers. And so we see that here as he concludes the journey and he comes back to report. The third journey, in verse 23. And after he had spent some time there, that's in Antioch, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So this is, you know, Paul's not there. Priscilla and Aquila are there. Apollos comes there. The man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And so now we, we are introduced to another key leader in the church. And so Paul, his base is Antioch. He launches back out, and he goes back to the churches that he had started, checking in with them. How are you doing? How can I encourage you? And then we have kind of the, the, the camera pans now to a new individual named Apollos. And Apollos came from a city named Alexandria, which was in Egypt. And, uh, and Alexandria was known as one of the intellectual hubs, not, not of necessarily philosophy, but other sorts of learning. And in fact, there was a library at Alexandria um, that was the largest in the ancient world. Some scholars believe that there was were between 400,000 to 700,000 scrolls. And actually, there's, there's some talk about the library was burned when Julius Caesar attacked Alexandria. And so there's some talk about where would we be as a species, as human beings, 
if all of that knowledge from the ancient world had not been lost. And so this was a great tragedy. It was known for its intellectualism, for people understanding the scriptures and study. And so um, Alexandria would have been down here. So Apollos, somehow God leads him to leave Alexandria, the center of intellectual study, and to come to first Ephesus, which would have been a large city in the Roman Empire, but then all, he goes over to Corinth. Now, here's a picture of the, the burning of the, the library in Alexandria. It was this crazy tragedy, this, this great tragedy in the ancient world. And so this is kind of the context of Apollos, who's now coming to Ephesus and then to Corinth. So we, we know that he comes there, and he's, he's passionate. He's preaching boldly in the synagogue. But he only knows the, bap- the, the baptism of John. He doesn't know that Jesus is calm, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he has resurrected from the dead, and he doesn't know how the Holy Spirit has fallen on the church, and how now there's this movement all across the empire to follow Jesus. And so he's up there preaching, and I'm sure Priscilla and Aquila are sitting there like, well, that's heretical. Well, that's blasphemous. <laughs> right? And so I find this interesting. What did they do? Did they stand up publicly and denounce Apollos? What does it say they did? They took him aside. And they showed unto him the word of God more perfectly. I think this is just a beautiful example, even recently, of conversations about conflict in churches and among Christians, that sometimes we don't do a great job of if we have a disagreement with someone, we just go start a different church. Or uh, we just go on Facebook and denounce someone uh, for their heretical views. These are very different people. Apollos, you know, if you can imagine, he's probably got a doctorate, all right? He's like (laughs) Dr. Apollos. And then here's Priscilla and Aquila. They're transient individuals that make tents. This is not a well-respected profession. And so what had to happen for this to work was on one hand, Apollos had to have the humility to accept this conversation, to accept this rebuke. How often do we see that? How often do I do that? All right? Somebody comes to me with a problem, how dare you? All right? But then also, Priscilla and Aquila had to have the courage to go to somebody. They weren't intimidated by the doctor title and just say, hey, Apollos, I, you're preaching this. and thank, I mean, this is great. Thank you for explaining the Old Testament. But do you know what Jesus is doing? And so they had the courage. Apollos had the humility. And they come together and why? Why did that work? I mean, what other setting would, would some tent makers talking to a doctor, why would, why would this work? Because both of them valued something more. And that was the scripture. So this was not a conversation, my opinion is better than your opinion. It was, we both trust the Bible, let's look into the scriptures, what's the right way? Now, in conversations or discussions, if you've looked into the debates around gender roles in the church, there's a note here that Priscilla is still named first and that she's a part of this conversation. Now, it is not publicly. She's not preaching publicly, but she is with Aquila as they go in to talk to um, Apollos about his biblical error. And so I think there is definitely room for us as fellow believers to have conversations around the word of God. I'll leave that to you for further study. Uh, But this passage comes up in that context. This is also a clear like, comparison in between Priscilla and Aquila and Ananias and Sapphira. Do you remember what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? They sold a property. They didn't tell the church about all the money that they had. And boom, one of them's dead. Boom, the other one's dead. All right? And so this is a different couple that are just so giving and loving. And they're helping. They help not just Paul, but now they help Apollos. And then Apollos ends up in Corinth, which is why in First and Second Corinthians... You have these like cliques that form. Well, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. And Paul has to actually directly address that, and he does it through humility. But it says that Apollos mightily convinced the Jews. And so we see like Paul starts out, but then you think about all of these different characters we've seen in this one chapter, Priscilla and Aquila, Justice, Crispus, now Apollos. So it's clear that the church has always been a one-man show. It's just that that man wasn't Paul. That man was Jesus, and he's also God. And so now these other leaders are coming on the scene. This is, this is not something that just one influencer, that one person can lead, even the Apostle Paul. And so we see the third journey kick off. And as we go into to 19, 20, 
20, there's going to be some just beautiful passages as Paul says goodbye to the Ephesian elders. And so we'll, we'll finish up the third journey as we get further into this. A couple of lessons that I pulled from this chapter. The first one is that everyone and everywhere can be redeemed. Everyone and everywhere can be redeemed. And it's very easy for us as believers to just kind of look at other people and kind of make categories of who can come to faith, who's not going to come to faith, and where I should focus my efforts. What do we see in the book of Acts? I mean, the apostle Paul's the Christian murderer, and he's the one doing the preaching, right? And where does he go? He goes to Corinth, the Las Vegas of Greece, and he brings the Bible. In the United States, there is a there's a movement of folks around the U.S. because of changing political and, and cultural developments. And sometimes as a, a follower of Jesus, somebody that believes in biblical principles, it, we can look at some of these places, some of these states, and we sometimes make jokes. I mean, this, I, I've shared these sermons in the podcast, so I might go out to like California or somebody in New York, and like we kind of, in, in the Midwest, like, why would you go there? <laughs> like, why would you want to go to that state? All right? And people are actually moving from places because of these things. And that, that means we, sh we should promote biblical principles. But when we look at it from a gospel perspective, we need good churches in California. We need good churches in New York. We need good churches right here in Indiana. And of course, Pastor and Missy spent a long time ministering in the state of, of California. And so as, as followers of Jesus, we shouldn't look at any place, any nation all around the world and say that place cannot be redeemed because the gospel is more powerful than that. And we see the gospel going forward in places that we, we thought maybe years ago there's no way for that to happen. So the scriptures tell us when you meet somebody, you don't know what their future is. What if that is a future Apostle Paul or a variant of that? What if you're teaching kids? I mean, what if that absolute difficult kid that just is so hard to deal with what if that kid is the one that's going to lead tent revivals going to lead a church one day and so as, as followers of Jesus we don't get to determine where the gospel should go we get to go where the Holy Spirit tells us to and then we leave it up to God Ananias go talk to Paul Paul go to Corinth and see what's going to happen. But it's the most debauched place in the entire peninsula, in the entire peninsula of Greece. Go there. So everyone and everywhere can be redeemed. The second one I might say is that God does the work. So the Apostle Paul is, he's depressed, he's overwhelmed. And Jesus comes in and says, look, there's much people in this city. I am doing the work. And it is so easy for us in Christian ministry and even <clears throat> trying to provide for our families, trying to deal with relationships, it's so easy for us to just put all of that on ourselves. But when Jesus says it is finished, like the work of salvation is done. One of my friends, one of his, his favorite verses comes from the Proverbs is that, that it is in vain that someone stays up the labor because it is it is God that is doing the work and so we can be so overwhelmed by all right what this ministry assignment and that but God is actually putting the pieces together we're just his agents and so we see the apostle Paul who gets down after everything that I've done but God, Jesus comes to him and says no there's much people in this city I'm at work here you're just an agent of that kingdom movement that's moving forward and so we see that great encouragement especially when we come to say, Labor Day, where we celebrate all of our labors and we take a break from it, that this is the same idea. That yes, we're doing hard things and we're doing what God has called us to do, but let us never forget that when we close our eyes at night, that they labor in vain unless God builds the house. And God's building the house. And so, whew, he's got this. Another one is to take your place. As I said, the church has always been a one-man show. But that wasn't Paul. That wasn't Apollos. It was Jesus. And look at these, these names, Priscilla and Aquila, tent makers, itinerant tent makers, 
from Rome that got kicked out and they come to Corinth, meet this guy, Paul, and they end up in Ephesus and then they end up in Rome. They have churches meeting in their house. Like, these are not nobles. They don't have degrees. They, they're nobodies. And yet they become central figures in the early church movement. So take your place. And I want to take just a little bit more time than normal on kind of a final point. And so here's, here's my recommendation for you this week. Take a daily dose of God's antidepressant. And as I was just, I was meditating on this a little bit uh, in preparation. And, and I was just thinking about here, those three pieces that God says, hey, I am with you. No one can hurt you. I have much people in this city. And, and I was just thinking about Elijah, and I was thinking about Joshua, and I was thinking about Paul, and how these, these great leaders of the faith how they were strengthened by this. And so do, sit, sit in, your, in your quiet time and just sense the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let that give you strength. Know that God is the king of the universe. If he's for you, who can be against you? There's truly nothing to fear. Not death, not financial issues, not sickness. Why? Because my king watches over my soul. And I will reign with him forever. And that there are much people in this city. We can feel alone. That's why there's a church. Reach out to someone if you're struggling. Know that it doesn't matter if things happen in our society. And it, it feels like we're, we're, all, we're outcasts because we follow what the Bible says. No, God has always had a remnant. He has much people in this city. So be encouraged. He's at work. But as I was reflecting through all of that, I just began to think about Jesus and how in his moment of agony, his passion, when you think about these three ingredients, Jesus only had one. So God's presence, you'll be safe, you have much people. The first one, and just remember that Jesus dwells in fellowship with God the Holy Spirit and God the Father in something so mysterious, so profound, so deep, so eternal that we can't even explain the Trinity. It's hard to even analogize to it. And yet, what did Jesus say when he was on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we know because of the spear that pierced his heart that he had, he had water around his heart, which meant that he had been in agony. He, he sweat great drops of blood, which Dr. Ellis meant that he was in an agony that's hard to comprehend. And, and we think about, we talk about all the physical pain of what happened, but what if a fellowship that was so deep that had been from eternity past, like forever, was suddenly rended? And as the song says, God the Father turns his face away. And so Jesus, as he was there on the cross, God was not present. He was God, but God the Father had to turn his face away. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. You find that in Isaiah. So one, the first ingredient, the presence of God, God had to turn his face away. Jesus was forsaken. But then secondly, everything's going to be okay. You will not be punished. Now what does it say in, in Isaiah? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was smitten of God. And as we think about the gospel, what happened? God, a just judge, had to punish the sins of all mankind. And he had to punish my sins. He had to punish your sins. And you think about the horrific things that we as human beings have done. The Holocaust. The killing of babies. How we evilly treat one another, how you have been treated in your life. And God is just and He is true. And so the gavel of God's judgment was going to come down on us. And instead, it came down on Jesus. And as Jesus rested there on the cross, God poured out the vial of His wrath. The full extent of His judgment came crushing down on His Son. And so there was no safety on the cross. 
In fact, it was God who was judging him. And this is what struck me. And God's ingredient for his antidepressant, Jesus didn't have God's presence. He was punished by God. But he did have something. And in Hebrews 11, verse 2 and 3, he tells us this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, look at those words, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Sorry if I get a little emotional here. Jesus didn't have God's presence. He was punished by God. But as he sat on the cross, he looked down through the ages and he saw you and he saw me. And that was enough. That was enough to keep him on the cross. And so when I say take a daily dose of God's antidepressant, what does that verse say next? For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. That exact point. If Jesus stayed on the cross for the joy that he saw in having you and me with him in eternity so we could fellowship together and we could worship him, how more should we leave here today, no matter what's going on in our life, and say, I get to tell my neighbor about Jesus. I get to invite someone to this event next week, and maybe they'll know Christ. That was enough for Jesus. It should be enough for us as well. So I will fear no evil, no terror, no darkness, no night, because my king watches over my soul, and I will reign with him forever. Take a daily dose of that this week.